We are very excited to welcome Abi Tanyafa Barale as the first visiting artist for our ceramic visiting artists and lecture series. Evi is a ceramicist, sculptor, and designer. His work explores cultural, spiritual, and material translations of objects, text, and symbols interpreted through a diaspora lens and abstracted around the aesthetics of craft and design. Raleigh received a BFA in ceramics from the Rhode Island School of Design and an MFA in ceramics from the Cranbrook Academy of Art. Barley was an ACAD teaching fellow at the San Francisco Art Institute from 2016 to 2018 and will be featured in the Objects USA 2020 exhibition and catalog. He is currently an assistant professor and the section head of ceramics at the College of Creative Studies in Detroit, Michigan. It's, it's great being here with you all today. I have um, you know, you know, very fond memories of studying at uh, Cranbrook and even though our current times last situation is unique because of you know what's going on with COVID. It's uh, it's still quite special, and um, yeah, I'm I'm uh, I don't know. Just it's just always a pleasure getting to either come in person or I guess now join virtually. Um, so, so I'm Ebi Tanyefa Barale. I just go by the first few letters informally. So just Ebi is fine. I'm an artist, sculptor, and ceramicist. Um, as uh, Alicia mentioned, I'm the section head of ceramics at the College for Creative Studies. I've been there since the start of 2019. Um, now it's been great being in Detroit and also great having Ian um, just up the street over in uh, Cranbrook and really great being close to Cranbrook just in general. Again, when the opportunity popped up to move back here um, for this position, I was really excited about it. So today I'm gonna keep things pretty um, informal. So I'm just gonna chat a bit about my work, some of my influences, some of my thoughts. Um, and the narratives that inform it. Um, but just want to say once again, um, well, just first thank you to uh, Ian for the introduction um, and Alicia for just organizing all of this. It's really, been, it's really been great. Just a little bit about my background to start off. So I was born in Nigeria, in Port Harcourt specifically. Um, a year, just shortly a year after I was born, I moved to Antigua. Um, and then came to the States. So I lived in, you know, I spent like one, one, one night in Miami and then moved to New York for about five years, Westchester, down to Georgia for five years and the last two years of high school in Connecticut and then did undergrad over at uh, RISD um, and then um, lived in New York City for eight years and bounced over to Michigan for, for graduate school, San Francisco and then back. So I kind of zipped around a lot to the, to the left there is uh, my passport photo. I, I don't have any baby pictures of me. <laughs> so that's like the youngest photo I can find. <laughs> and to the right is just a shot of me um, at my studio over in, over in RISD. So I, I, I drew um, a lot um, as, a, as a younger artist, as a child. Um, even though this piece is titled Only Child, I am not an only child, but um, I would make these very quick um, and freeform drawings and then pull things out of them. Um, like I'll just kind of like scribble on a sheet of paper and then whatever I saw, uh, I'd kind of like enhance. Um, let's say it's still a part of my creative practice. Sketching kind of creates a space for generative investigation in what I do, loosening this connection between my mind and my body. Um, I did a little bit of painting as well, but I kind of just felt unsatisfied with this distance that existed um, between myself and the work, um, the work and the viewer. But just thinking about this form of investigation, just the way I would work abstractly with the uh, drawing, and I am fascinated by the ways in which artists are able to reorder and create their own realities. So this is one of my earliest ceramic sculpture works. Um, so early on, I was thinking about the body and the figure um, while kind of exploring clay. Um, I started making things in clay because I wanted to create forms and pieces that would confront, um, I guess, space and, and reality in a way that like bodies um, confront space and reality. So thinking about working from the body was just a, a natural first step. But even with that kind of uh, doing so pretty abstractly and pretty loosely, I think I left off here just talking about um, some of my early ceramic works and then jumping into um, some of the 
uh, sculpture work that I started creating when I went off to college. Um, so I think I was talking about how I was moved, I moved from creating work that was more representational to creating work that was more abstract and with this piece working intuitively, kind of tapping into the poetics of the material. Um, being really interested in this dialogue that happens between like Clay's materiality um, and my choices. This piece is dedicated to John Coltrane. I'm a big uh, jazz fan. I'm just really interested in sort of how this dynamic between, you know, what I'm thinking and what I'm doing and what the clay does then like thinks or rather how, how the clay responds um, relating that to kind of the, the dynamic that you would see or, you know, if your musician experience in like a, you know, jazz trio with this, this kind of like back and forth. Um, the clay has a fluidity and a malleability that's responsive to even the slightest, uh, you know, movements of my hand, my body. Um, that this kind of performative um, discourse is kind of like a part of its, you know, kind of inherent nature. But once clay is fired, um, it becomes entirely permanent um, and it lasts through the ages. In fact, we're still digging up um, items that were made, you know, hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, um, yet with one bump or nick, um, a piece is entirely brought to, to pieces itself. Um, but thinking of time, I really love this quote by Chris Rock, and I'll just read it. So some people say life is short, and that you can get hit by a bus at any moment, and that you have to live each day like it's your last bullshit. <laughs> I don't know if I could curse. <laughs> I wasn't expecting this to get r rated <laughs> Life is long. You're probably not going to get hit by a bus, and you're going to have to live with the choices you make for the next 50 years. I think it's the only funny but really true actually <laughs> i listen to a lot of stand-up comedy while i'm in my um, studio um but clay's relationship to time is ultimately connected to our relationship to time both uh, uh, fragility and permanence in the material exists alongside um, each other um, embedded within nature and embedded within society the fragility of working with clay actually prompted me um, early on um, I just kind of, uh, it's, it's, I guess, the fragilities of clay and certain insecurities around uh, that and the sense of permanence um, prompted me early on to kind of explore taking works that were modeled in clay um, and actually cast them in metal, sort of thinking about the, the, the tensions of a different material. So this piece is modeled in clay, cast in um, bronze, and then nickel plated. So metal doesn't have the same kind of immediate fragility that uh, clay has. It's not going to break or chip the way clay does. Um, but over time, it's actually more sensitive to um, probably corrosion and breaking down. So this is kind of interesting, kind of reversal um, in the short term rather than the long term. Clay is, clay is still um, a pretty hardy material in the, in the long term. But, so much of how we think about and way permanence has been shifted by the, you know, the digital landscape that we are all now living within and surrounded um, by. Um, so here with these two pieces, Hey Sunshine, You're the Best, and kind of taking emojis that we associate with the flatness of a screen and planting them bluntly onto these kind of viscerally activated clay forms and uh, uh, surfaces kind of flattening this idea of time between like the real space and the digital space through these symbols and emojis. Um, kind of zooming back to my time when I was in college, I, I had to learn how to use the potter's wheel. It was just a part of my major as a ceramics major. I at first felt pretty limited by the axis of working uh, on the potter's wheel, just picking things that kind of fit within that framework of, you know, you know throwing down and up. Um, but I soon came to really appreciate valuing throwing as a discipline and started to explore um, and introduce elements of like uh, discovery and chance into the work. So with these forms, I, I kind of would throw um, like a pretty basic, um, you know, kind of profile of the vase form and then take a little bit of slip or a lot of slip in the case of these works and just kind of trail them down uh, the surface of the piece. So you have this kind of mark um, that happens in a moment, but once again, because of the nature of clay, it gets frozen um, in time once it dries and gets 
uh, fired. I, uh, I really also developed a strong interest in the uh, functional form, specifically the, the, the vase form, as a result of working um, on Potter's Wheel. And I started to bring some of that um, sort of abstract thinking that I was applying on the surface of my Wheel Form works um, into thinking about actually sculpting functional forms and combining um, sort of my um, abstract sculptural interests with um, this kind of functional canon that I was developing on the Potter's Wheel. So the casting kind of started to allow me to blend uh, sculptural interests and design interests. As, you know, I consider it to be kind of like a design process mold, mold, you know, first creating a model and then creating a mold. So these vessels are actually modeled um, out of oil clay um, and then slip cast here, they're both slip cast in porcelain. Um, the vase to the right, Miles, um, you know, I'd say I, I see technology as an important and exciting element in the world of art production. And early on with Miles to the right, I just noticed slight imperfections that would come through um, in the cast that I was getting out of my mold. Um, this would have been back in like 2006, I actually um, hired a, a craftsperson to digitally scan the the slip cast um, there, the cast that I have there, to make a model. And I hung on to that model for about eight years. <laughs> um, and then when I came over to CCS here, we were able to get a 3D printer. Um, the idea was to be able to use the Potter bot that we have to kind of get around some of the um, technical limitations that I saw in slip casting, but I learned very quickly that every every process, um, whether it be more techn technologically oriented or manually oriented, has its own subjectivity and 3D printing um, very much exists within that realm itself. I kind of see the 3D printer as being an extension of the, 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 the hand. It's kind of like its own sort of um, matrix, um, but it also comes with its own sort of issues. So I'm able to take this kind of model and form and translate it through the hand if you will, the 3D printer. Um, but it kind of becomes a very different type of thing altogether because of the texture the printer gives it um, and the kind of technical issues that I have to work through to um, realize the, the, the form. That's something that I think about a lot, ways of leveraging technology in order to create and make, um, well, thinking of technology as a tool um, then sort of like my capabilities as a, as a creator and maker. Um, the function itself is uh, fluid, so um, you know these are vase forms, but I don't think I've ever actually used them. Um, this piece here found references Duchamp's uh, fountain piece, which you're I'm sure all familiar with, um, but rendered using torn little compressed um, bits of clay that are kind of placed, um, kind of like in, in place of like actually coiling, just kind of like. A, built up um, to create the wall of um, this piece. So visually it seems soft and generally functional, while it's actually pretty sharp um, and not at all watertight. Uh, just the suggestion of function is enough for us to understand and categorize how we fit things into our lives. And let's say the vessel as a form, object, and metaphor is really able to challenge and break down these uh, boundaries. Um, so just kind of thinking of sculpture as a, as a proxy for the way in which we think about things or see and understand things that we associate with as being functional. So I'm interested in the way in which um, functional objects in our life, in this case, um, with still life, a, a drill, um, even when they're not being utilized or used, project a certain sense of agency. Um, over space and over our environment. So these kind of drills have been, you know, modeled in clay, so they don't look quite representational, they look kind of loosely representational. Um, and they're on this shelf that's slightly elevated and from this perch kind of just suggest their utility without actually being um, used or utilized to build or create um, anything. So, Let's say our lives and lifestyles are represented in the things we have, the things we hold on to. When I specifically think of a folding chair, and as I mentioned earlier, 
Um, I've moved quite a bit in my life. I think of a certain kind of transience that has defined a number of seasons in my life. Um, and this piece folding chair, it's a ready-made folding chair that's covered with wet clay that over time dries and cracks. Um, so this piece was a part of the planned obsolescence exhibition that I was part of at San Jose State University. Um, so the wet clay, while it's still wet, provides a malleable um, kind of surface potentially for someone to, you know, sit on, um, but would actually mark, you know, either your clothing or kind of get, get you dirty if you were to actually utilize it. But over time, um, it shifts, it cracks off the chair, kind of evoking this sense of material um, being able to shift and, um, you know, go from being soft to being brittle. Um, so from a kind of material transformation to a material translation here, with stacked tubes, I'm taking the form of a stacked tube and representing it both in clay as well as in fabric. So um, I think it was actually my time at Cranbrook that really got me interested in thinking about working with uh, fabric. And when I moved to San Francisco from my first position as um, a ACAT teaching fellow at SFAI, I spent a lot of time uh, both learning how to sew and uh, sewing and here just kind of investigating not only the, 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 the visual uh, difference, but kind of like the sensory difference between the same form, um, one in clay and one in muslin, um, but and stacked in the same orientation. So it's kind of like a philosophical piece, kind of very different um, from my um, other work, but um, significant at this point in time um, for me because I hadn't allowed myself to create anything that I don't know, suggest as being this kind of conceptual almost appearing sterile in nature. So going from kind of this, you know, philosophical place to something much more personal, um, thinking about home and thinking about family. Um, so to me, home is both a space and a construct. Um, I feel communally, ancestrally, and culturally and physically rooted in different places because I've moved so much, I feel like I've developed a framework of home that's, you know, somewhat portable um, in its nature, um, as far as how I kind of like understand what becomes home. This is an image of my youngest niece uh, to the left here against the backdrop of some movie with Bruce Lee in it. I believe it's a uh, game of death. I kind of like how her pose mirrors uh, Bruce Lee's uh, pose. And um, to the right is a picture of my uh, mother and my, um, so the left is my youngest niece, to the right is my mother and my older niece taken outside of church one Sunday. Um, I am interested in uh, sort of like the passing on of generational knowledge, um, particularly as it relates to spirituality. For me, this mode of passing on spiritual knowledge has been entirely mediated through um, relationships, and I'm really grateful for that. I'm grateful not only to my mom, but also to my father um, for the ways in which they have embodied um, sort of generational knowledge as it relates to spirituality, but as it also relates to many things. Um, for me, my father was a person who really um, inspired me to become an artist. Um, I often think, consider how I'll hold the legacy of my parents and um, think of this idea of inherent inheritance. My parents weren't rich by any means. These two pieces, Adesua and KCA, I've dedicated to um, my, um, my, my parents, these mixed media compositions. So aside from the things which are largely emotional and immaterial, um, you know, my greatest inheritance from my parents is probably like my physical body, um, but also really the way I think, again, I mentioned that my father was the one who really inspired me to uh, well, recognize my talents as a creative individual. Um, and cultivated those talents. He's kind of like a, you know, he was a doctor, my mother was a nurse. He's kind of like an intellectual hippie. He would always say, follow your bliss. And my mother would always say, make it work. So she was a practical side. He was the more sort of like <laughs> esoteric uh, side of um, things. Um, let's say our re relationship with materials uh, starts with our relationship to space and environment. So going from thinking of home, um, I don't know, there's this kind of continual exchange between understanding where we physically are, the things we expect and want in those environments and the nature of those things. Um, so whether it be, you know, like my home, my studio, 
um, my workplace, um, any one of these uh, contexts, I feel like we have a, a tendency to try to make ourselves feel more at ease in environments by spreading ourselves out and spreading ourselves around, you know, in the form of like getting things and placing things um, around us. And um, with this piece titled One Piece, I'm really thinking about what it means to accept just being one part of a greater context or of a greater whole. So each one of these boxes or these cells kind of represents, you know, an abstraction of a different context and each one of these ceramic pieces in them is a different state of being or a different state of mind in each one. And this is a piece that I actually produced while I was, um, while I was at Cranbrook. So seeing America as my primary space and context, like there is a felt impetus on me as a person of color uh, to challenge systems of racial bias, blindness, and abuse uh, through my work. So maybe Barack is one of my uh, favorite uh, poets and uh, I'm, I'm really drawn to this quote of his, the black artist's role in America is to aid in the destruction of America as he knows it. Pretty bold and, uh, <laughs> and uh, pretty um, blunt. I mean, I think, especially in the context of everything that we've seen over these past several months, um, going back, you know, long before George Floyd, but just kind of thinking of this kind of moment that perhaps has really been sparked by um, the killing of George Floyd and, and subsequent, um, you know, um, matters and things since then. I think it's really important for us to, um, even in the context of COVID, to really ask ourselves why and how um, what we do as ceramicists matters um, in addressing the issues of our day and in addressing specifically the social inequities um, of our day. We don't just create in a, in a vacuum. So whether it is responding to the realities of COVID and the very kind of present pressures that we're feeling politically and socially, these are the things that we bring to our practice and these are the things that I feel like I have to kind of contend with um, in my own practice. I, I wouldn't say that my work as, uh, is very politically or racially charged, um, but I am interested in considering how art can be actively de destabilizing, um, deconstructive and constructive all at the same time in response to societal concerns. So kind of thinking about that, but also re in reference to one of my um, favorite artists, Glenn Ligon. Um, so I have a blended sense of identity as a person of African origin and heritage, um, and as an African American, somebody who's lived in the United States for most of my life. Um, and these identities don't always present themselves equally in every context. Um, so Ben Ligon is an American conceptual artist whose work explores race and language, desire, sexuality, and identity. Um, I feel like there's a cultural disconnect represented in Ligon's work that perhaps anyone here who's a member of any diaspora can relate to. So I'll just read this piece. I, I went to Africa. I went to Motherland to find my roots, right? 700 million Black people. Not one of those motherfuckers knew me. <laughs> And uh, I, don't know, I feel like this kind of just really succinctly kind of summarizes perhaps I would feel like I haven't I actually haven't traveled back to Nigeria since I left. Um, and this sense of homecoming that I would expect in going back to Nigeria, I can imagine being very kind of like um, abruptly <laughs> um, challenged by just this kind of sentiment, like, you know, thinking that you're going to arrive and it's going to feel like everything is there, everything you've been waiting for is there. And uh, kind of acknowledging and recognizing that the, 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 the DNA, the experience that you've um, engendered and the identity that you've cultivated as a person of blended identity kind of creates a disconnect now or could potentially create a disconnect between um, who you understand as being like what you are and who you are. Um, and your sense of connection to your place of origin, to the place that you are um, actually from. And I feel like ultimately um, as, a, as a person, as individuals, as artists, we have to just acknowledge, make peace with that uh, disconnect. So um, um, what now um, is both a, a kind of like prayer and uh, provocation. It's probably my most frequent prayer. <laughs> What do I do now? Um, not often a provocation. I'm not, I'm not quite, I'm not quite that, that, that guy. 
um, but just kind of thinking about uh, Lyon's influence, I'm, in, I'm drawn to how, um, uh, well, just first thinking about incorporating text into my work, but drawn to how text uh, rendered in clay is able to shift in um, meaning. So rendering something, you know, written or digital versus in the material of clay um, kind of shifts the both the sincerity and the playfulness of a particular phrase um, back and forth. Um, so this piece, uh, Real Feels, and kind of addressing that um, very directly, um, kind of thinking about this disconnect between, um, you know, like real feels, and I have an accompanying piece that says, just says feels real, where, you know, the, the way in which we understand what something is really oftentimes doesn't have anything to do with its, I don't know, molecular or scientific nature, but simply how we understand it to feel, um, simply how we relate to it um, emotionally and experientially. And I'll say, as far as relating to things um, emotionally and, and experientially, I'm interested in the spiritual and emotional agency of creative, uh, created, created objects, specifically, um, let's say statues, shrines, idols, stools, pottery, um, within the context of um, Yoruba culture. So the Yoruba people are the people that um, I descend from. So in Yoruba culture, twins are believed to be the reincarnation of deity. Um, traditionally so, um, so much so, um, that uh, when twins are born, um, after they've, uh, well, they're venerated when they're born, but after they've passed away, these Abeji statuettes are created to kind of embody or, or encapsulate the spiritual energy of um, deceased uh, twins. And they continue to be um, venerated. They continue to be sort of esteemed within um, a, a household. So apparently in Yoruba culture and perhaps even in Nigeria overall, there's a is a um, large occurrence of, of twinning. I think it's like 7% and might actually be even higher. And when I was going to be born, my, um, my mother, I thought she had twins. She actually had triplets um, that passed away before me as well as another child that passed away before me, um, all, all, all girls. Um, and I kind of wanted to create a piece. This is another piece that I created while I was at Cranbrook. Um, that would sort of put myself in the position of um, kind of um, incorporating this idea of the Abeji in my own life. Again, being mistaken at the time, thinking that my mother had twins, but actually had triplets. So I guess we need to include a third um, piece here. But with this piece, Abeji, Abeji means twin, Ori means head. Um, Ori is believed to be, or the head is believed to be the seat of the soul um, in Yoruba culture. So when I was born, you know, my parents said, you know, Ebi Tenyefa, which is my full name, um, meaning that, you know, whatever, what is good is best, whether I, you know, whether I was a boy or a girl, hopefully I'd live, you know. So that became my name. <laughs> um, but I oftentimes think about the triplets and the one child that passed away before me, and maybe my parents wouldn't have had me um, if they had lived. So I kind of created this piece to kind of commemorate um, their memory um, and I guess to a certain degree, their legacy and the fact that I'm alive. Um, but wanted to kind of talk a little bit about process being that, you know, you're all ceramicists and this is actually work that I produced while I was at Cranbrook, thinking specifically about how clay operates, not just as a final material, but as a um, intermediate material. So I kind of created this form just by drawing in, in space with, 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 with wire um, covered that then with chicken wire, covered that then with plaster, covered that with clay, which I carved um, and made a rubber mold of and then cast into the form that you're seeing here. So even though the final form is plaster and burlap, so burlap is right below the surface, you kind of see the texture of the burlap to the right there on the form kind of uh, somewhat zoomed in. Um, the way in which I'm thinking about and working with clay very much informs both the process and the aesthetic of this um, piece. So this piece is titled Dupped Up. It's in the show that's up right now at the Cranbrook um, Museum. 
Um, so um, dub is Caribbean slang for uh, ghost. And dub is um, the single P is Caribbean slang, slang for hello. So I mentioned that I grew up for a short while in Antigua. So this kind of piece translates very loosely into this idea of, you know, hello ghosts and thinking about what it means for me to kind of take, um, I guess, the spiritual identity that I've developed as a person and develop my own um, iconography in reference to that spiritual identity rather than just simply inheriting what's been passed down to me from uh, tradition and incorporating the same similar process where I'm starting with a profile, um, knocked out in wood and chicken wire, covering that with um, burlap and plaster, covering that with clay, and then making a rubber mold that here specifically I'm, I'm, I'm kind of placing this pattern of sisal rope within and then pressing um, plaster over so you see this pattern of the rope and burlap coming right through on the surface of this piece. Um, kind of a very similar process here with this piece titled Revelator, kind of thinking about what it means for an object or a being to exist between the state of the waking world and the spiritual world as an, as an intermediary, you know, if you will. So this piece is kind of, you know, positioned as kind of like standing at a certain kind of like crossroads um, and following, you know, the, the, the very same process um, here, these, these, these works were exciting for me because it was a time, it was, it was probably the biggest pieces that I produced um, at the time. And also, uh, um, I don't know, just, just a way for me to think more um, about space and about context because these took up so much more space. But once again, um, relating to this idea of working with clay in a very different kind of way than I had um, in the past, is this sort of intermediary material that informed even though it wasn't represented um, in the final final piece. So this piece is titled Adamus Ori. So going back to this the idea of the head as being sort of like the seat of the soul. Um, but I'd say, you know, I mentioned that I, I'm Yoruba, um, thinking about the spiritual identity that um, I hold. So I'm a, I'm a Christian person. So um, my belief system is, Ju is Judeo-Christian. Um, and the way in which that sort of uh, contrasts or relates to um, sort of like the indigenous spirituality that um, relate to Yoruba culture, specifically this idea of animism. So animism is kind of this, this practice of associating um, a sense of spiritual embodiment into inanimate objects. So whether it be trees, stones, um, whatever. Um, so here kind of taking this idea of the head um, and kind of with this kind of like, these kind of like faux ears, if you will, um, kind of modeling these forms that look like something in between um, a, a, a living, breathing being and potentially like a rock or a tree. And again, another process shot here, um, you know, just kind of very similarly drawing in space, covering a form with um, this mesh tape, with, with plaster, with clay, to model the form that would then uh, get um, press molded in this case, and this is the press mold here. Um, this piece probably was the beginning of me working a lot with press molds. I really enjoy that I'm able to get a certain kind of scale um, pretty efficiently, even though there's a lot of like upfront work in producing a press mold. Um, the kind of scale that I'm able to get by, by kind of like um, pressing a shell into a mold and just using that as my film form um, I found to be, even though, again, really taxing to develop the mold, but really efficient um, as far as working with multiples and um, working with potentially a limited amount of clay um, versus having to slip cast or you know, carve a piece like this solid. So something that I, I pretty much carried on um, for, um, I guess, uh, I guess for a whole series of works, this piece is called Mayping. Um, I talked a little bit about sort of this investigation around functionality in my practice here. Taking the Mayping um, vase form, which is the Chinese vase form, and um, muting it, if you will, by uh, taking away the opening. So these, these pieces, even they have a, a vase-like body, they don't actually have an opening that's able to render these as being functional. Um, so they're read as entirely being sculptural, and then adding these striations that I associate with the, this kind of Yoruba aesthetic beauty, kind of these uh, ripples that are used to render, uh, traditionally used to render skin in Yoruba culture. 
the inner process shot here of how I'm developing the press molds. Just very simple um, press molds, um, just two part press molds um, to create these forms. A very similar kind of process here. Um, this piece nest almost becomes reminiscent of like the chest or the body um, of, an, of an individual, but also like the texture of an actual nest itself. And once again, it's a simple press mold to um, produce that. Um, you know, I, I mentioned I started sewing when I first moved, or rather when I moved uh, to San Francisco. And, and, I, and I really do credit, once again, um, the influence and exposure to a lot of the fabric work that I saw um, while I was at Cranbrook to kind of emboldened me to jump right into this. Um, so this piece is titled Ori Afar Tefila. So um, Ori, once again, means head. Um, Afara is the Yoruba word for bridge. And Tefila is the Hebrew word for prayer or prayer shawl. Um, so with this piece, kind of thinking of what it means to exist between different worlds. Um, so the, you know, I guess the real world and sort of like a spiritual um, world. Um, as far as how this piece is rendered, so I'm using um, burlap that I'm layering over um, a body that's that was first modeled actually um, via rhino, built using wood, um, chicken wire for like the surface, and then sort of I'm taking this quilted burlap that I'm then kind of forming over this body that I've created. I think of the quilt as being a very charged um, object. I'm thinking about like the quilt of, you know, Guy's Bend, um, kind of like this form that kind of um, embodies or encapsul encapsulates like the histories of a, of, of a people, but at the same time um, offers uh, comfort, offers a way of, of, of containing um, and nurturing and protecting the body. And a, and a burlap as a material that represents a certain kind of transience um, so thinking about it as like a you know a material for transporting goods, whether they be coffee or or or, or other elements. So um, the nature of the burlap and the nature of the way in which this surface is made, being quilted, um, you know, really kind of like mattered, or or I wanted to sort of like speak to the way in which I'm thinking, or rather speaking to spiritual identity. And then here with this piece, told Ori Afar Petrita, uh, Petrita being a Greek word for uh, fatherland. Uh, thinking about what it means to exist between where I am, you know, as a as an American, if you will, and where uh, where I understand my fatherland or my homeland to be, um, these pieces are kind of divided between two pedestals, so they're a little, you know, unstable. Um, you know, kind of referencing, I guess, a little bit of the instability and kind of having this sense of blended um, identity, but also thinking about what it means to sort of um, um, I guess dwell in a place of being in between um, and that of being this kind of perspective that I walk through society and culture with and another process shot there uh, made with the same kind of process of a quilted surface over a wood structure. So here um, I mentioned that I uh, moved to San Francisco. I spent a lot of time looking at things that I see and find um, on the street. Um, so when I lived in New York City, in Long Island City, I would, you know, I would just kind of walk around my neighborhood and I would see discarded elements um, in sort of like the semi-industrial neighborhood that I lived in. And in San Francisco, what was different is that I'd see things on the street all the time. And oftentimes I'd, see, I'd find things on the street because there was just so much homelessness in San Francisco. So you know, like the things that, you know, we would consider potentially to be like trash or refuse could literally be somebody's bed, you know, could literally be somebody's um, uh, home. Um, I was just kind of drawn to the way in which these, these, these things, these objects, you know, have maybe, or had like maybe like a primary identity or original identity and a very different kind of identity in the shift from being domestic or existing within sort of like an inside space to existing outdoors. Um, case in point with a mattress, a mattress, you know, is something I mean, you sleep on a mattress every day. Um, but the minute, you know, you, you find one out on the sidewalk and it's been out there for a while, it goes from being this very kind of comforting and nurturing thing to something that you don't probably want anywhere um, near you. Um, but also acknowledging and recognizing, you know, 
the, the, the photograph that I took to the right, which is somewhat problematic because that is actually a person underneath there. I, I kind of took license to present it since their face isn't being represented. Um, but this, this, this is life, or that, that, that is life for so many people who live, like that, that, is, that is their home, um, that is their room. So even though my idea of what home or dwelling or my idea of what it means for something to function exists one way, um, it, it really became or started to become important for me to honor the way in which these objects uh, would have shifted identities and lives um, functioned in a very critical and important way for people who had a very different or have a very different circumstance from my own um, and recognizing acknowledge, acknowledging that as being no less valid um, and not secondary in any way, but just kind of shifted. In general, um, I am kind of interested or, or think about sort of the kind of intimacy that we have with ceramic objects, whether they be bowls or plates, you know, you go to your cupboard, you know, probably most of the things that you have there um, are, are ceramic. Um, there's a certain kind of intimacy in the way we live very closely with certain ceramic objects. Um, and I wanted to bring that intimacy to my actual environment. So here with this piece titled Contacts, I kind of created these forms that are almost abstractions of my left and right foot. Um, and I use them to map my neighborhood in the Tenderloin region of San Francisco. Uh, there's a video that accompanies this, but I'll kind of skip it for now in the interest of time. Um, but this is kind of a, this is a significant piece for me because it's the first time that I'd actually used an art piece to kind of mediate um, my relationship with, um, with, with my exterior space. So outside of a gallery, outside of a home, um, and I'd say now being in Detroit, it's something that I'm, 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 I'm still thinking about. So there might be a, another iteration of this piece that's um, specifically relative to being here in the city of Detroit. It's a piece titled Impressions. So just kind of thinking of how, um, you know, I, I'm interested or drawn to using clay to map my environment. Um, I produced this piece uh, about a year or so ago. Um, when I was invited uh, to Luther College for um, an exhibition and lecture there, and I wanted to make something that spoke specifically to that environment, as well as to the students and the body um, that was there. So literally, um, so these are uh, wooden panels, um, and for each one, I covered them with clay and had four of my um, uh, helpers, if you will, student helpers, um, impress their fingerprints into the surface of this piece. So. Um, you know, our fingerprints kind of exist or operate as a marker of our identity. But here, um, that sort of multiplied times, I don't know, hundreds, um, and embodied in each one of these panels. And then like um, my folding chair, kind of over time, over the course of the exhibition, would dry and, uh, and crack the specific one on the student's name was Iris. So this is a mass performer from the village of uh, Dossi in Burkina uh, Faso. Um, so you can think of a mask as being this interface with a person's identity um, that then abstracts or completely replaces um, their actual face, you know, like abstracts or completely replaces their sense of identity to the rest of the world. Uh, the markings on this mask represent um, the generational lineage from ancestors to the present, and the journey of spiritual development from childhood to um, adulthood. Um, so I'm really drawn to and think about sort of like the patterns, the symbols, the kind of abstraction um, that I associate with West African culture that I've you know, kind of discovered in West African culture, um, and taking, I would say, some license to explore those same kinds of symbols and patterns and the work that I'm creating and working with clay. This piece titled Labyrinth, the textures that you can see, that you see here kind of um, relate to the striation that um, is kind of just depicted on that mask, but also speaks to um, the tilling of land um, patterns are here um, within this form of a pattern that you know, I relate to or call Labyrinth different sets of the same thing. Here with this piece, um, Serpent, um, going back to kind of thinking about um, on a certain level, uh, 
with regards to spirituality, the serpent as, um, I don't know, this object that embodies both positive, complicated, or negative associations in creation um, myths. Um, and relating that to like the Dinker symbols and the Sibidi symbols, these pictographs um, that themselves uh, predated um, the Latin system of like text and language, um, but were very kind of like potent abstractions for or to mean or to express things within society and culture. And here, allowing myself once again to take that language um, and apply it to these cells, if you will, that kind of operate as um, windows um, into, um, I don't know, different textures or different patterns or different landscapes that are oriented on a wall rather than oriented on, you know, a pedestal or on a floor or in a space. You're doing the same thing, um, but utilizing what I um, call um, these motifs that I relate to um, uh, fabric patterns, um, West African fabric patterns and designs. So this, this quote by James um, Baldwin, I'll just read it to start off. It's the state of birth, suffering, love, and death are extreme states, extreme, universal, and inescapable. Um, we all know this, but we would rather not know it. The artist is present to correct the delusions to which we fall prey in our attempts to avoid um, this, uh, this, this knowledge. Um, so I'd say I, th I think about, I don't know, I feel like I think about death a lot and not in like a ominous or, or weird um, way. And, you know, unfortunately, particularly now um, in the context of COVID, we've been confronted by death and suffering um, and hopefully, you know, love um, um, in ways that, you know, um, you know, are greater and perhaps more, more, you know, greater than what we ever kind of thought of or considered or expected for this season, this time. But in general, I think about these things um, uh, a lot, even though these things have very much been brought to the forefront now. Um, I'd say now, as a, as a result of the teaching that I do, I'm actually doing more pottery work. So I'm teaching two wheel throwing classes um, this semester. So it's been interesting for me going back to a form of making, even though a lot of the work that I've done has been sculptural, um, going back to a form of making that I probably originally equated to being um, much more technical um, or much more about making sort of functional things. Um, but now getting to kind of really kind of in the context of what we're living through, but also just as being a more mature artist, think about how um, I guess this style of making or this kind of, you know, practice of making um, resonates very much beyond that. So to the left is, is, a, is a chalice. I've been making a lot of these. And I think about this within the context of the Eucharist, which is um, within religious practice um, uh, used to hold blood, which represents the, the body of, um, well, the blood of Christ, rather. Um, and then to the right, um, an urn that I actually made for for my father, he actually passed away um, not too long ago um, with regards to um, um, yeah, COVID. Um, and for me, it was, it was really both a deep honor, um, considering that he was the one who inspired me to become an artist and didn't you know, belittle or discourage my desire um, to become a ceramicist, um, to be able to honor him and his legacy. So he's, He's um, over in my living room <laughs> right now, this urn. <laughs> and I, I gain a lot of, I would say, um, satisfaction and um, pleasure from being able to live um, with this form. So in addition to the one that I've created for myself, I created three separate urns for myself as well as my um, future siblings. So the fact that I'm able to use this material um, not only in the way I understand how I mediate my relationship to spirituality, um, but also in the way I now kind of mediate my relationship to my father's body and his legacy in a very different way now that he's um, passed away. Um, it kind of brings the reason why ceramics matters to me and the reason why I hold it so special um, in my life um, full, full, full circle. I want to end with this um, piece of portrait one. Um, so I mentioned that I've been doing a lot of uh, wheel throwing 
And here with this piece, it's, it's somewhat reminiscent of the face jugs that one might associate with those created by freedmen and enslaved potters. Um, but here, you know, once again, no openings and no sense of um, fun function, kind of blending uh, the sense of like, um, you know, a tortured face and a, 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 an abstracted face, um, somewhat uh, disfigured and exaggerated face with um, a sense of repose that I kind of relate to the way in which I, and I would say now um, our, our culture and society is kind of coming to terms um, with our past and with the ways in which we've, um, I don't know, created histories and created um, complexities and created unfortunate um, realities um, around the way in which we've kind of built society and created our structure as, as it relates to slavery, as it relates to the kind of, you know, police brutality that we're seeing as, as, as it relates to the systems that we're hopefully trying to dismantle now, um, sort of, you know, embodied in this face jug and being brought to the present with me now making these um, portraits. So I'm also just drawn to the idea and the thought of um, kind of using real thrown parts and pieces to work more um, sculpturally, blending this interest that I have in real thrown forms with um, my um, interests and um, uh, ideas that I've been developing sculpturally pretty much since I've started working with um, clay. And um, yeah, that was a lot. So I'll just end it there and say uh, thank you.